Welcome, 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 guys, to Bomberos on Fire podcast. Uh, before we start, I want to say thank you to everyone who listened to the podcast, the newcomers, the guys who came back, the girls who came back. Um, uh, and, and thank you for, to people in Spain, Poland, South America, U.S., and Canada. Uh, I think it's a brand new community that I'm opening to, which is great. Um, before we start, if you don't mind to like, subscribe, share, you know, click all the buttons, all the crap is on the tip somewhere over here. I uh, appreciate it. We can make more content and keep keep the the good uh, intentions. And I have to talk a little about my sponsor. It's called Roto School. They're from Florida. And if you want to have a dream to become a, a, a pilot, helicopter pilot, be on the sky, just fly. Those are the guys that can help you, even if you're international. If Even if you're outside the U.S., they can help you with your certifications. They have programs to help you out with uh, money, because it's not cheap, let's be honest. But they can help you with that. And, uh, well, thank you to Roto School. And now I have a really special guest, really knowledgeable, expert subject matter to me, from Frontline Wellness, Michelle. Thank you for being here, and I can introduce yourself. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So you are our first podcast, like I mentioned to you, you were the yeah. first one uh, to reach out. So yeah. Yes. Uh, so I'm Michelle from Frontline Wellness and Therapy. And uh, I have this practice with my um, business partner, Emma Rasmussen. And uh, we, uh, we started this um, private practice to uh, specifically focus on frontline um, first responders, frontline personnel, and their families. Uh, so we welcome families. Uh, we do do couple sessions uh, as well. And um, and so that's anybody in a frontline type of profession, including um, social workers who work in frontline um, yeah. professions, who I think a lot of people don't really think about them, right? So um, at least here in Canada, in Southwestern Ontario, where we are, when there is a, a mental health call um, of any type, uh, self-harm, uh, someone in crisis. Uh, there are several police, um, I think many police organizations that go out with a, a social worker. Uh, so they pair up and it's a police responding and a social worker, a crisis worker. Uh, so they will go out to those types of calls. Uh, there are social workers in emergency departments of hospitals, of children's hospitals, wow. uh, social workers on crisis on crisis lines. Uh, social workers are everywhere. People don't realize how many uh, places that we are. So, um, so, and then of course, child welfare, frontline uh, social workers. So there's a lot of jobs where social workers actually would be working alongside what everybody commonly knows to be a frontline worker, but we kind of get forgotten a little bit. So a little shout out to frontline social workers as well. That's awesome. Uh, it's like dispatchers. People forget about dispatchers. They just think it's the, the voice in the sky. But no, they also deal with a bunch of stuff. They might not see it yet, but uh, they they deal they're with the a first. lot of things on the phone. The, it's the first, they deal with the first responders. And then they have to, yeah, they want to help, but they cannot help more because they're, they're, they're limited to what much they can help especially in the moment of crisis. And so, sitting. Um, sitting. And, yes. In yeah. a room. Yeah. Yeah. Just listen to people screaming, literally. Yeah. Added and then, yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah, I never thought about social workers having also that much potential. And, and wow, that's amazing. That's pretty cool. And uh, I want to talk about a little mm -hmm. bit uh, on the suicide, the stress, the anxiety that the front line, including social workers, experience uh, if you can talk a, a little bit about the earliest things like we see everybody talk about the post suicide or the post uh depression or anxiety attack or in the acute moment the crisis like oh i want to kill myself everybody everyone wants to talk about it but nobody talks about how to detect how to find out or even how to educate people that are getting to the field regardless the profession in, in your case social workers uh firefighters paramedics or police or military how do they don't talk about it in the beginning so you know what you have to deal with and maybe make choices in your life that you say, you know what, I don't want to deal with that. I want to choose another career path. I can help in another way. So what do you can say about all the things that I should talk? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, there's a lot there. Um, 
I guess I'll start by by saying that when it comes to a helping profession, I think the biggest difference between um, social workers and mental health professionals, therapists, psychologists, is that are, I'm going to say are, because we work in kind of that helping like on the mental health side field, as opposed to frontline personnel, police, fire, dispatch, okay. nurses, um, and others that are training on the mental health side. A lot of our, our schooling is actually spent doing a lot of self-reflection and really looking at why are we doing this work? What are some triggers? Hey, if you come across this in your life, in your work rather, are you going to be okay with that? And really getting deep and you do it. I, I, it's almost like therapy <laughs> doing this, yeah. the, the schooling, uh, because you, every paper that you do for, for school at the end of it, at least in, in the programs that I did, they would ask you to really self-reflect on um, dissecting again, what all, any triggers, what any issues might be, how could you work that out? How would you respond in this way? So you're constantly doing this self-reflection piece. On the other side, in all the other frontline personnel jobs that I named, I don't think that there's a lot of time spent on no. if you were to go to a call <laughs> and oh, you no. see something that reminds you childhood how are you going to deal with that there's not a lot of self-reflection and dissection and I don't mean like tell us about your childhood experiences like it could even be experiences in your adulthood or teenage years and nothing to do with your family it could be you were in a car accident when you were 22 and now you want to be a firefighter how are you going or a paramedic how are you going to be when you get to the scene of a car accident, did you work through that? Did you, you know, unpack that? So it's oh. really any experience that you've had. All right. Did you do, did you do some? No, no, I don't think they even mentioned it on uh, the fire Academy that I went or even the paramedic school that I, that I took. And, and I work in different countries. I work in Venezuela as a paramedic and in the U S currently. And South America, they don't even mention mental health. They think it's a taboo. So I don't even start in South America. Right. <laughs> At least here they recognize we have a problem. But South America, generally yeah. speaking, they don't even want to admit it. It's a problem. Yeah. So if you think about, um, I guess, what you know, if you look at some of your colleagues and yourself and you can say that the nature of the job is that you're going to be exposed to traumatic incidents on a daily basis, even if it's not directly and you're just hearing from a colleague or somebody else in a different department and their traumatic experience. It's just characterized by trauma and traumatic experiences. Yeah. And why can some people do a 25 or 30 year career and be kind of seemingly okay and sure there was the times that they were bothered and there's that call that really kind of got to them and a little shaken up but like they're otherwise okay and why are others on on sick leaves and extremely distressed two years in five years in 10 years in and really struggling throughout their career almost kind of dragging to the finish yeah. line of either retirement or, or, or medical discharge. Like why, if, if you were to be, you're in the same job and you can even account for same backgrounds, genders is a little different. I'll talk about that in a sec, but there's, there's how come you can do the job for 30 and you're okay. And I'm all screwed up. You know, you say to yourself three years in, like, I can't do this job. Yeah. And if you make it, like, what, there's a lot. Why? A lot of commit suicide in the Central Florida area. The past two months, literally, it's like three suicides. Just one happened oh, in uh, May. Was a lieutenant from the city of Orlando. I have to say that uh, commit suicide. Everybody thought he was fine, and just just like that. And it's another one recently too, uh, up north uh, from Florida. Um, so yeah, suicide is killing firefighters. I mean, as, oh yeah, like cancer, Absolutely. suicide, heart attacks. That's suicide wasn't there. Yeah, mental health is years. killing a lot of people, and especially after COVID, uh, I encountered a lot of yeah. mental health calls 
after COVID for anxiety, depression, uh, suicide attempts, I not just in the first responder, because you don't see that often because we don't talk about it. We don't want to admit that we have a problem, but in the general public, I had a lot yeah. of those calls, the anxiety general and depression. Population. Oh yeah. It was yeah. insane. Yeah. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, kind of back to like, you know, thinking about going into career of first responding, helping people. Um, it's really important to consider childhood experiences. So um, that would be called they've done they did a big, huge landmark uh, study and it's called the adverse childhood experiences. Um, others will interchange experiences with events. And okay. what that landmark study looked at was 10 um, events that would occur in your in your childhood that they would call adverse. And though some of those questions would be, um, did you have, um, did you feel like you didn't have enough to eat? Or did you have to wear dirty clothes and no one took care of you? Did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment, or death? Um, did you live with anyone who was depressed or mentally ill or who attempted suicide? Um, did you live with anyone who had a problem with drinking or using drugs or prescription drugs? Uh, were you abused? Um, either like hit, punched, or beaten? Uh, did you live with someone who went to jail, a, a caregiver who went to yeah, jail? Yeah. Did you witness domestic violence in your home? So they would look at these adverse events. And what they found is that the general population, about 70-ish percent of adults in, in the United States would have one. The more adverse childhood events that you've had, that's correlated with physical health and overall long-term mental health and early death. So the more boxes that you can tick off of those, and there was a couple more I didn't mention, the more susceptible you are to physical, mental health and, and um, an early death. Wow. So <laughs> you consider that and then you consider your um, vulnerability to mental health issues, having especially four or more, but even just having one. And then you're going to go into a job where you're going to potentially be seeing and you will, I mean, let's not say potential, you're going to see everything I just listed, you're yep. going to see yep. maybe every single day, all 10, maybe one or two, but this is what you're going to be seeing. And so if you're already going in with a vulnerability or susceptibility and you haven't sort of worked that out, then when you see these things in your work, the probability of you being more impacted and it compounding things that you already had there, no fault of your own. Yeah then you do become more vulnerable to a mental health issues, higher risk of suicidality in your career. And so it's important to think about these things early before you go into the job, not to say because you had an adverse childhood event, you shouldn't be a police officer or firefighter or something, but have you integrated that experience and work that experience out where it no longer physically triggers you, where it no longer has you re-experiencing trauma when you think about it so that you can go and help the folks, the citizens that you're going to help, the children that you're going to help yeah. who may be in the exact same adverse situation that you were as a kid. Wow. And I imagine that you should have that assessment done before or during the academy or school or before you actually uh, take the career path, right? Kind of. I mean, that'll be ideal. That's what they're talking about in the research. Okay. It is what they're talking about in the research. So not necessarily there, but certainly in terms of like, well, okay, so they do all this data gathering and they do the research to find out that these are, you know, some statistics. And so it's kind of like, well, what are we going to do with it? 
should this be? So one thought, here's one example that you know came in the research. If you were a, um, a police officer, let's just say, and yeah. you were the victim of exploitation or sexual abuse as a kid, and then there is a child pornography, um, you know, a task force who has to sit and watch hours oh. upon hours over a one or two year period of time where the task force, should you be, should you be the police officer it, 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 on this task force? Like, is this the best place for you? Um, wherever. So they look at it, like, should you be? And so thinking about those vulnerabilities, I mean, you and I would probably say no. No. Yeah. And so, so they think now the problem Armando is going to be that not everybody, just because you had the adverse events, it can also work for you in the work. If you have integrated this experience and you're now going to pay it forward and now you're going the compassion and the empathy and the care that you can provide to a child in this situation or we don't say our child victim is child that you could provide because you've been there firsthand okay is 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 you know, it is, you can't even put a price on that because there's something, there's a lot of things you're not just going to learn in a book and you're not going to learn from going to school and you're not going to learn from having a diploma. If you have the lived experience, what you could potentially bring, if you've worked that childhood experience out, what you can bring forward to pay forward um, is something that maybe some of your colleagues who didn't go through that couldn't understand because they didn't have that same experience. So that's kind of the difference. Either if you haven't worked it out, you be, could be going to this call and be extremely distraught. You're looking at this little child and you're having an out-of-body experience. You're looking at you. You're looking at little Michelle. And you're not looking through of the eyes of, of the caregiver. And you can really experience a, a very traumatic um, reaction. But if you've integrated this experience and you've worked these things out and it's, you're not triggered by it more. You can go in and really provide a helping hand um, to this family, to this child that other people wouldn't be able to do if they haven't integrated it. Yeah, you can relate. You can create a, a some type of relationship, and you can use that as a as like you said, as a force to help you to do your treatment or your care better. That's probably yeah. yeah. Wow, that's that's uh, like. For example, I experienced a lot of uh, maybe suicide, not in my family, but since I've been working since I'm 17 in two different countries, I experienced a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I even went to the jungle <laughs> one time. So I, I experienced a lot wow. and I can relate to a lot of things because of that. But I have to say, it, it took a toll on me. Like mentally, it took a toll. And, and uh, that's why I switched uh, locations of jobs. Uh, and try to do my best to take care of my mental health because to me it's really important to just try to do your best. I love my profession. I love to help people, but I also recognize that if I'm not okay, I'm not able to take care of other people. At least in my point of view. Yeah. Yes, it is. Of course. Yeah, you have to be. You have to have. You know, those. You have to fill your cup and before you can pour into another and all those things. But they. They are. You know, they're not really cliches. They are. You know, legitimate and like good for you for reaching out and trying to stay within, but find these different. You know, little avenues that you could go down that. You know, yeah. you stay within to try to manage that. That's super important to do. Yeah, very important I, to do. And I think what you're talking about is really important to talk about it before you get into the field. Like have a, a talk a day during the academy, doing whatever class. Let's talk about the actual consequences of going to this field. Let's talk about the mental toll that will take you. I think uh, if you give options to people, they will make better decisions. Bad or good, they will make a decision. Okay, so I think I can deal with that. Because not everyone is prepared to this. Uh, a lot of the new recruits it's in the fire service. They're, not, they're 19, 18 years old kids. They don't used to. They never seen somebody die, or somebody dismember. And first call or a child abuse or a cardiac arrest in a kid. So the first call they have is that, and, and that, like you said, that can compound 
years and years and years, and hopefully they make it, but they might not make it in the best way or the best shape possible. So I think what you're touching, early prevention, early education is, is sometimes more important than the post suicide treatment or the post uh throwing all the all the pills on the patient because he's having anxiety depression and all that it's it's really important what yeah you actually it, mentioned. It, it brings you it to your awareness so i think we're yeah. on a little de delay there i didn't mean to talk over you oh that's fine i was gonna say that to your awareness right to to really be doing some some self-reflection i think the best thing i ever heard um uh, a, a psychologist say was in terms of the work, just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And that's in relation to, you know, your mental health that, yeah, sure. I, I, I've been in really tough situations. So now I know I can go and be the best, you know, police officer, firefighter, what have you. But, but the toll that it could take on your mental health, if you were already vulnerable, is is potentially damaging and it, it potentially could take your life so just because you can doesn't mean you should and if you want to be in a helping profession there's a lot of helping professions out there and so sometimes yeah. just being very self-reflective and realizing that the job isn't going to be all um do you have to get, get that there you go i got a dog yeah <laughs> he's at the door <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was like, it's going to sound like my cat at the door. My cats haven't come to visit yet. So <laughs> so <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, just having that vulnerability, it's important to look at that and think to yourself, really, really thinking to yourself, like, okay, cool. Sure. It's very cool to be a hero when you're, you know, saving lives, you're wearing the uniform or you're following in your grandpa's footstep or your grandma's footstep, or you're the first person in your family to go and achieve this goal that other people had, or, you know, you're a hero or you're watching on TV and you're really seeing kind of like the you know, the, the glamour shots of, of, yeah. of, of what it looks like. And, and in reality, are you ready to see, are you ready to see what you're going to see and how, if you're not, how are you going to get ready? And the other thing is, can you get ready? And it's all yeah. theoretical before you go into, because things you're not going to know till you get there. Yeah, exactly. You don't know how you react to a car accident, for example, or a building collapse. You have no idea. Some people can go through training and yeah. perfect. But some people can. I had, uh, I remember my early days, I got rookies that like, scared of the fire. I have to push them in, even though they're doing training. So what what tips do you give to people that want to get into the fire service, police, you know, the front line, dispatchers, social workers? <laughs> what are you tips you will give to people to to manage that or do an assessment on the mental health before going to full time in that field? Well, I think the first, it comes down to, and um, I've tagged in, in, in our social media, I mean, I've tagged at Travis Gribble over at my arena yeah. where he's talking, his message as he goes around is really go early and go often in terms of mental health, you start early so that you already have developed trust with somebody who okay. already has kind of gone through your history taking and all of that. So that when you get there for your therapeutic session, you're not going through talking about kind of what brought you here. Um, you're already ready to kind of jump into if there was an incident or what have you. So starting early, and often, so you already have that trust built, you've got that person's number, you're not on a wait list, you're not waiting for a spot to open up, you're already there. The other thing is to, um, is to be ensuring that you're really having uh, a practice. And this is beyond I go to the gym. Like, okay. cool, you go to the gym. This is beyond going to the gym. The gym is great. You know, you'll see on our social media, Emma and I, between the two of us, are at the gym every day. That's our practice to be able to be strong physically and mentally to help you. We're not going to be, you know, not we're not going to be able to help you if we're also not mentally resilient and strong ourselves. Yeah. Um, but to be ensuring that you have interests outside of this space, that you follow accounts on your social media. Maybe you have two accounts outside of this space. 
so that you're not scrolling through and seeing videos of of standoffs, videos of fires, videos of traumatic incidents. It, like if if all you follow is it's also the... in your space, then on your off shift, you're still in it. Yeah. This is me scrolling up. You're still in it. So maybe having two different accounts. This is what I do to kind of stay kind of on top of things or what have you with work. And this is what I do without having friends who are not in this space, having so that you can kind of get a check. Now, of course, it, usually first responders will kind of see those friends as, you know, being pie in the sky and, you know, so idealistic because we know what goes on behind those closed doors, right? Like yes. we know what, you know, what, 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 you know, the show is and what's going on behind the closed doors. It's hard. I understand. But having family and friends who aren't in the space, having hobbies that have nothing to do with, with the space. So, you know, whatever that is, fishing, skiing, rock climbing, whatever is having hobbies outside okay. so that you're giving yourself a tap into this other world and with other people who have a different view, whether you believe their views realistic or not is not is up for debate. <laughs> but it's important to stay connected. Having family, if you have any type of um, spiritual practice, whatever that is, whether that's formal, more religious, or just a spiritual practice, super important. And again, and of course, your physical health, but not crossing the line. Because I was, I was, by the way, I was a personal trainer many eons ago. And so on the physical side of things, I would see then you can take the physical, the exercise and make that be your escape. And that becomes yeah. a whole different problem, but that's a podcast for another day. <laughs> um, but staying balanced in the exercise, yeah. uh, staying balanced in the exercise so that it's rejuvenating and energy giving and not depleting and exhausting so that you're just running yourself into the ground, both at work and then via your exercise. So really making sure, and that's a, that's a tough one. That's one people don't, don't think about or talk about. Yeah. Again, that's a podcast for another day. It is because, uh, I like workout. Uh, I'm not a skinny guy. I'm strong. I might not be fast. But I'm strong, but, uh, it's true. You need to have a balance. You cannot go all in because a lot of, a lot of firefighters, a lot of my people put it that way. They say, I don't want to go to therapists. I don't feel like talking to somebody. I always just want to work out. I want to run 20 miles. And I, I find oh, out, yes. I find out like, hey, bro, I, I get it. You need, to talk, you need therapy. I mean, you need to talk to somebody, even if it's just once a year. Uh, and I was that guy before uh, into, into lifting weights. And and now yeah. I, I think the podcast is my little therapy session every time I do it because uh, I release yes. a lot of the things and it helped me. I think this is my hobby in a way. Uh, one day I will get paid like Joe Rogan, but for meanwhile I'm doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's true though. It's uh, a lot of a lot of people said I don't need to go to therapist. I just go paint, uh, fishing, or go uh, yes. work out. And and I think you need a therapist. I mean that's what you guys are here for. So yeah. how do you, how you know do you what? convince I realized somebody? It. How do you convince somebody? Well, like anything, oh, if they don't. Oh, how do you talk to somebody <laughs> to, you know what, work out, but you also need to, because that's hard. It is hard. You know, the, the, the average time in therapy for people when they do go is, is eight sessions, is eight visits, which is really not a lot. And I, I, I hear a lot of times it's because it's because of a few things. And I'll, so I'll talk about the few things. So beyond we all know, and I don't have to kind of beat this one because everybody talks about the stigma we know, the, the, the stigma of themselves or within an organization or beliefs about it or stereotypes about they think they're going to go in and, uh, you know, lay on a couch and talk to somebody with a little button up suit and, you know, little penny loafers or something really like rigid, who's going to be psychoanalyzing them. And they're like, you know, this is a bunch of bullshit. Um, you know, like they're thinking TV movie type. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of those preconceived notions of like what therapy even look like, looks like. Um, then the other the other reason they stop going or what so if they do go, they're like, okay, fine, I'm not going to go to that kind. I'm gonna I'm just gonna go. I found someone. They look cool. Da -da, is that right off the bat? 
they could just not feel the vibe. Therapy, and it's funny because I just shared yesterday uh, um, Gabor Mate's uh, video, but my one of my very first videos on our page was about the therapeutic connection, which is 80%. They've done research on this because people be like, therapy doesn't work. So they does therapy work is was the you know, research question. They found that it does work, but it works because of 80% of it rather is the therapeutic relationship. Do you like your therapist? Are you vibing? Do you have a good energy with them? Because if you don't, you're not a going to trust them. B, you're not going to want to talk to them. And C, you're not going to come back. So you're going to go, I went to a session. They were an idiot. I didn't like them. And I never went back. Therapy sucks. It's stupid. It doesn't even work. However, if you go and you do have a connection with a therapist, which is the most important, and you feel safe there, and you feel that they're hearing you, not giving you fake empathy, like if you were to tell me something about your work right now, which I don't want to hear right now, <laughs> I'm not ready for it. But if you were to tell me, and I would be like, yes, I understand. I probably don't. I, I don't. Unless yeah. you were to tell me about abused children, which is the front line that I worked in for over a decade. If you were to tell me anything about children being injured or hurt, I could, I could hear that. And when I say I understand, I understand. Firsthand, I understand it. But if you were to tell me about a car accident or seeing dismember or anything very, I would not be able to say I understand because I don't. But having empathy and compassion for what you've gone through, that's a human experience, I think, that is important to, to feel. So a lot of times, especially in the front line, um, first responders are, are kind of feeling like they are being told by their therapist, oh, I understand. And they don't fucking understand what you're talking about. And so they right away feel like, no, you don't. I'm out of here. Yep. So there's that in, in, in front line. Um, the other one is that it doesn't have to be, this is kind of an, what I realized again, over 20 years ago when I was a trainer, this is, this is how it would go. And this will kind of bring me to answer questions, a little bit of a story for a second. I, when I was a trainer, I um, had all my certifications, went to college the whole nine. Mm -hmm. And I found this was my own, like, not formal research study, but it was kind of research, which is what led me to kind of the answer I'm going to give you. Uh, that after, so we would start with the program. You're going to do these sets and these reps, and this is what you're working to. After four to five sessions, people kind of knew what they were doing. And we kind of stopped talking about the exercise. This is working this muscle, and this is doing this. We kind of stopped talking about that side. And all of a sudden, life started to be shared. The mom's talking about the stress she's having with her four kids. She hasn't, you know, gone on a date with her husband. Work things start coming up. Life things start coming up. Childhood things start coming up. And all yeah. of a sudden we're working out. And I'm kind of in a therapeutic role that I had no business being in at the time. And I noticed that as the body was moving and we weren't like this, staring at each other doing therapy yeah. but we're kind of like more like this and moving that as the body was moving and the comfort was there things were coming out that were yeah. emotional that really needed more psychotherapy than a personal trainer so what i realize is that yes working out absolutely gets you know your your hormones regulating it helps with your cortisol and uh, adrenaline assimilation and it helps you to be more resilient and all these other things but if we could combine which some people are doing and there's a lot of change in this area of mental health with movement and we're either doing walk and talk therapies, which which we do at Frontline. We do walk and talk. So we're alongside each other and you're not facing. So we are walking in nature, having these other symptoms. There are people in the States, especially who are doing, um, they are mental health professionals and they'll train you, but they're doing mental health and physical. So they're doing oh, wow. stuff in the gyms. Um, wow. Because we've noticed that just things come as the body gets moving. Yeah. There's actually somebody in Florida. 
I have to find that account for you, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? Where we're yeah. we're working on the physical, but as the body's moving and releasing, which yoga has known this forever. Yoga has known this forever. That in certain poses you release certain emotions. If you do a pigeon pose and you had a lot of tension in your body, emotional stuff, releasing your hips can make you cry. Not because pigeon pose hurts, but <laughs> which it can. But the the motion, <laughs> the motion. Well. But. <laughs> Yeah. Yoga has known this forever and a day. Yeah. That is why yoga exists, but getting other people kind of round. So, so sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent just to say in terms of getting people to do it is that it all goes together. It's not compartmentalized. It's not, I go to the gym. So now my mental health is good. It all works together. Just every, all of those pieces matter. The gym and the grounding and the going outside and having friends outside of the work and making sure you have a spiritual part. Like it all is the package. Got it. It, th- that's the package. That's the, that, this is you in the middle. And this is everything that surrounds you to keep you safe physically and mentally. All of those things combined is, is what keeps you safe. So, you know, trying to convince really, it ends up being, it ends, what happens is it really ends up being word of mouth. Hey, I went to this therapist. She was cool. Knew exactly kind of talking my language to go there, but it is. So, so if people do find a therapist that works for them and is licensed in their state or in their province or wherever, and you can share with your friends, Hey, this guy or this girl knows what they're talking about. Honestly, try one session and they'll know in, they'll know, listen, for frontline people, <laughs> personnel will know. I always, I, you know, I talked to a guy from um, a Toronto Fire Association last week. I said, it'll take, we offer 20 minute free consultations. It'll take a, a, a firefighter two seconds to know if you want oh, yeah. to meet with that person or not. Yeah, we can go through the bullshit. Take 20 minutes of the free consultation. Seconds. And yeah, we can. We can. We can see. Responders. They're... Yeah, we can see through the bullshit yeah. quick because you're so used to it. So we know when this, this guy's not for me or this person's not for me. I'm out. And and then and yeah, and I know. I I seen it. Um, so you guys take advantage of those, right? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Because you go straight to the point. You know what you want. Um, so you guys approach is like holistic approach and frontline, uh, in your private practice is holistic. Yes, absolutely. We are, we are everything. And that's how, that is how, you know, we maintained longevity, longevity in, um, you know, frontline child welfare when we were there, that's how it's the only way to do it. It's the only way to last. Um, and it all, it, it, it all goes together. You cannot isolate certain parts of yourself and hope to be okay. You, you think there's not extremely fit people, fit guys and girls who are committing suicide or oh, struggling yeah. with depression, and anxiety, and um, alcohol abuse and other substance abuse and having, you know, and having that leak into like marital and interpersonal relationship issues. And they have a six pack and are jacked, you know, shredded. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the gym's your, the gym is your therapy. You know, so people say, yeah, I mean, it is, it feels good. And after we get off this today, I'm going to go and do a little, but yeah, Emma was there this morning. I think at like four 30 in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> it's good, but is it therapy? It's not, but you know what? Does it work well in conjunction with therapy? A, a, a thousand percent. In fact, I would say you can't get your mental health right if you're not working on your physical health. I don't think that you can. I don't think that you can be completely, um, uh, you know, not moving your body, not exercising, eating shit, drinking shit, and sedentary and improve your mental health. I don't think that it's even possible. The yeah. body and the mind are connected. Yeah, you can you can be as fit as you can, but if you're eating shit, you'll never lose weight or you never get the weight that you want. I agree with you. I struggled with that for years. And fine I'm getting there, but I'm that's yeah. I can I can feel that personally. 
it is a struggle yeah. if you don't have yeah. all yeah. if you don't think like that like you guys yeah. holistic and let's say that I, I need some therapy and i like you guys can somebody from the states or outside canada can contact you guys and get a session with you with your front line so that is a no right now but what you so if you want if you're covered through benefits or um in Canada, we have what's called um, WSIB, which is the Workplace um, Safety Insurance Board. So if you're if you're it's a workplace injury and you're through WSIB instead of benefits, um, if you're going through benefits and you have benefit plans, then we wouldn't be licensed as a therapist. You can do it called coaching or consulting, but it's not really recommended. It's best to find a licensed person. Now you can be licensed and I'm right now working on my licensure, licensure for Florida. So I can oh. be, I'm licensed in Ontario. I'm as, we're licensed in Ontario and I can also work on my licensure in Florida, even though I'm located in Ontario. Okay. Um, and definitely in the States, it's more common to have, um, multiple state licensures, um, depending on, because every single state in the States has their own regulations. So, yes. if you, and especially if you're going to be going through, uh, and it's through like the health boards, right? So if you're health departments, if you're going to be going and looking for somebody so that it's, um, it can be run through the benefit plans that you have, your extended health benefit plans, and, and you get coverage, they're going to have to be licensed in your, in Canada, in your province, and in the states in your state for that, for that to be covered. Okay, like yeah. a, like an EPA kind of system, you know, uh, employee programs uh, yeah, assistance exactly. system? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, so to be eligible, they're gonna be like, "Where's this person um, licensed?" And so uh, right now, uh, we are all licensed in Ontario. So if somebody's in Ontario, and that's virtual, you don't have to be in the same city. We can uh -huh. do virtual or in person if you're close to us. Um, but when my licensure comes through for Florida, obviously that's virtual. But hopefully one day in person. But uh, you, no. yeah, yes, yes, we'll be glad <laughs> to come here to fun. Florida to the Sunshine State. Get some warm weather. Yes, yeah, it's too yeah. cold over there. <laughs> um, actually, yeah. Let me know when you got that license in Florida because I'm currently uh, getting my step into a peer support team. And it will be great to have awesome. you guys as a tool just in case. Another option. I'm not saying go extremely to you guys, but you have an option. Like you said, not everybody therapy. It's a list. It's a list of people. Yeah. So whatever and you feel like, you go for it. We all have different personalities. You guys all have different personalities. We all have different personalities. You really have to find who you vibe with. Like not everybody is going to like me. That's fine. That's cool. And same with like we have, there's a lot of therapists out there. You've got to find your person. And that is what makes a world of a difference. And, and then the other thing to kind of backtrack for just a second is that eight session thing that I said that people usually kind of stop around the eight sessions is, is the work really hasn't even started to get going yet yeah, like there's... people think like even with emdr people think they just are walking in the door and i'm doing some eye movement with, you know desensitization and they're leaving no no emdr even as a as a therapeutic approach is an eight step process and the whole process is emdr step four of the process is the eye move is the eye movement desensitization but steps one through eight are as important even though step four is where you're doing this or the tapping but step one through eight is emdr and in step one you're doing history taking and you're, and you're gathering information and trauma history. And the therapist is doing what's called a case conceptualization is I'm taking you Armando and I'm, I'm, I'm coming, you're coming here, but I need to go back. I need to peel layers. Yeah. And then we start to prepare you for, we're going to get to step four, but we have steps one through three to prepare me as the clinician to understand what we're working on after step four. Then we need to integrate, we need to reassess, and we might need to do some more. But people are like, oh, I'm going to call and they think they're going to come and sit down for a therapy session and I'm going to boop with your magic wand and like everything's <laughs> what? So eight sessions is really when the work starts to get going and that's when people 
quit. Give up. They're done. Yeah. For for those it, who don't know. Work. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's yeah, it's just uh, I think it's perception because for people, a sessions, I'm done, good to go. And I'm, I'm clear. I'm saying again, yep. back to work. It, that's not how it works. Yep. Therapy can last yep. years, uh, months, years. Yep. It's not just three sessions. I'm done. Yep. For those who doesn't know yep. what that process stands for and what is that process for? In a, in a okay, short... sure. Yeah. So EMDR, is... sure. Um, so first of all, I, I, I want to also acknowledge that not all we do talk about, and, and I'm so glad for social media in some ways, right? Like we hate social media, but we like love it. Like you and I met, we wouldn't be able to be here right now if we didn't have yeah. it. And, and, and but the other, but the problem with it at times is of course, like, there's like, you know, the e goods and evils of it is that it doesn't, um, it right now in the mental health field while like everybody's talking about mental health and i'm so glad for it because it really does help get the conversations going spreads yeah. the message um you know we raises awareness is right now all i'm hearing for the most part is is ptsd in mental health and first responders but yeah. there are a lot of other mental health issues out there that first responders experience that maybe they never have ptsd not first of all, not every first responder is going to get PTSD. It's not just doesn't come with here's the badge, here's your uniform, and here's your PTSD in 25 years. Yeah, have yeah, fun. And here's the phone number for the that you may have fun. No, not everybody's going to have it. And again, I just kind of want to bring you back to the first things I was talking about was vulnerabilities and susceptibilities to developing in those compound. So then the other thing is not every mental health issue is PTSD. First responders, which I spoke to a little bit earlier, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, yeah. uh, and subclinical PTSD, because PTSD is a very specific diagnostic criteria. Not everybody meets, PTSD. but just under that subclinical PTSD, where you have most of the tick boxes, but not all of them. So that's problematic in, in many ways, because if you're having everything except for one and you need a note from your psychologist to take to your work because you need to be off for a bit and you're subclinical, you don't fall under um, That's crazy. PTSD um, diagnosis. And then again, there's other mental health. So, so that, I just want to touch on that for a sec because um, EMDR is m used in trauma and PTSD. So it is eye movement, um, desensitization and reprocessing. That is the acronym. And it's a little bit complex and I'll just kind of like brief because I don't want to yeah, do a yeah, whole yeah. podcast on here. Yeah, I know. But it's just, just what, short. Yeah, yeah, very short. Is yeah. It is um, it is to integrate. So doesn't get rid of. So I guess a myth is it doesn't get rid of the traumatic um, event out of your memory. It does not erase your memory. It is not magic and also it doesn't work for everyone. It's an amazing tool. It's been around for a long time. Again, social media has made it like it just came out yesterday. It yeah. has over 30 years of research. It's been around for a long time. Oh, wow. What's wonderful is with the uh, social media and with the growth of sharing and people getting healed by EMDR as one of many therapeutic interventions, but this is a key one because it really works on a traumatic um, event reprocessing. So what it does is it works on the premise that um, your eyes will um, move back and forth, not cross midline, but move back and forth. You'd follow my finger while thinking of a traumatic incident or memory. And it's for certain, it's at a certain speed. It's for a certain number of repetitions, which you're, it's not it, it, like what your clinician would work with you on in terms of determining that some people get dizzy and can't do this oh, I can't imagine. and follow my fingers. Like some people, like there's a lot of things to consider when it comes to the implementation of EMDR, which is why you don't just plop in the office and be like, all right, I'm here for my eye movement and I'm out of here and I'm going back to work. Like, no. It's going to take a minute for us to figure out what's going to work for you. So the idea is that there's something that it does, which there's some different bodies of research, which I won't dive into, of how it helps to essentially create new neural pathways 
when the eyes are moving that way, to connect what was severed and disconnected and compartmentalized in the trauma. The trauma happened, there was a disconnection, and then this over here. And it helps develop these neural pathways to integrate the traumatic memory. You'll wow. still have it, but what it will have done is the um the um the charge of the memory will not, you won't feel like you're right there like you were that day anymore. It should lower the the char electrical charge you have in your body, that traumatic re-experiencing, like I'm right there, I'm here, like fuck, get me out of here. It yep. will integrate the experience. You've processed it. Again, the, the idea is that the brain has created new neural pathways and that you will be desensitized to it. And now you're more resilient by the way, with trauma, they have found that the more you've been able to process, the more resilient you are also for subsequent traumatic incidents that you will um, be experiencing. Wow. So you've gotten through one and you'll probably be able to get through more um, if, if you work on that. So that's kind of the, the Cole's notes. It's a big process. Um, it's done in many different ways. Um, some people have tappers, some people, uh, cl clappy things. Some have a light bar. If you're virtual, um, you can set up a light. So it goes across the screen, the speed changes. There's a lot different, but that's what it does. There is talking in it as well. So some people think that, oh, it has, you know, you just do this thing. There is talking because you have to do, you have to explore um, negative beliefs that may be blocking you um, or um, like you almost do do cognitive behavioral therapy, to be honest, when you're doing it. A lot of people say oh, wow. that they don't you know, like CBT, but you do a lot with EMDR. Anyway, I digress. I, I won't go on about EMDR. <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's beautiful. Tool. And it's just another tool in the toolbox. There's a lot of different, as there are many different therapists, there yeah. are many different therapeutic modalities as well. Yeah. And and I didn't know there was, uh, I knew there was for acute, you know, PTSD, trauma and all that. You know, it was also for preventing for the future trauma that you will suffer because uh, it's not just the guys about to retire or the person about to retire in 30, 25 years of career, regardless what it is. It's also the person's in the middle of the career or the beginning. Because you can experience whatever in any time moment in your career. And if you really like uh, helping people, all that, you need to, you need to, I mean, like you said, create resilience and create that uh, base, a strong base so you can keep moving forward if you want to continue in that career. Yeah. And I think going kind of back to how I, I had wanted to start this, uh, that when we talk about that, why can some people get through a 30 year career and, and seem pretty, you know, pretty okay. And they, and they're honestly actually okay. And others aren't. And that just speaks to too, is that just because you had a traumatic incident when you were a kid, if you overcame that and you were able to integrate that, that speaks to being resilient for subsequent traumatic experiences that you're going to have in your career because you've overcome one so you can overcome another if you've done it well on the opposite side of that you had a traumatic experience that you didn't work through well and the next one not well and those compounds so as resilience compounds over your career so can traumas that you if you aren't resilient you don't work through those can compound over your career and those have two completely different outcomes oh yeah one is a third year resilient career. I saw a lot of shit, but I got through it. And the other is every single time I had something, it just, it was another brick in the backpack. And I just yeah. got more weighed down and, and the, my career's over. All to you. If you make it, some people won't make it on the career. Um, that's awesome. Uh, exactly. Thank you for explaining that. I really don't know the, the, that tool that many uh the functions of that tool and uh it's almost an hour see when you have fun pass time pass yeah, fast we're good. I think we're yes good. that's awesome, awesome. It sure does. so yeah. what tips will you give to a brand new firefighter i got my backpack i got my uniform ready to go next next shift what are you giving <laughs> to that person that is about to get into that field what advice you would give them 
So I touched on something earlier, but I I'll, I'll, to finish off, it'll be um, find a therapy, consider what I talked about here in ACEs. What childhood experience have you gone through? Are there any that are like, when you think about what I said before, if you are going to see a child as yourself, as little Armando, are you going to be okay? Or does that go, oh no, if I saw that parent do that thing and I got there, I will, you know, F and flip my lid, I'll, da, 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 I'll kill him. I'll, you have to think of what the trigger is going to be because you're going to be talking to the parent potentially or the kid. You're going to yeah. be seeing some, are you okay? So think about it. And then when you think about it, you don't have to go, oh, no, I can't do this job. Maybe you say that, but maybe you don't. You go and find a therapist, start to work through that early. Then your relationships develop. When you get on the job, you know who to go back to. Don't lose all your friends, like I said before, that you know that you had before you were in the service. Stay balanced. Keep your social media clean. Maybe it's two accounts, so you're yeah. looking over here at you know trips to Paris and people, you know, uh, traveling and like ocean and people, you know, fish swimming and cat videos. And over here is all first responder stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um. Take care of your physical health. And it's not about a six pack or being jacked. I mean, I, you know, we, we'd we like you to be able to, you know, take care of yourselves and stay yeah, safe function. and keep other people safe. But eating well for hormone balance, sleep, getting yes. the sleep. And what yeah. helps with that is getting the therapy, is taking care of your physical health. That'll help you um, with sleep. There's some yeah. things that are going to be unavoidable. Right. There's just some things that are just going to be unavoidable. The nature, it's shift work, man. It's shift work. So are you going to have the best sleep of your life? No, you're not. No. You do the best that you can. Be careful about the coffees and the energy drinks and all of that stuff that, especially the hours you're taking, your circadian rhythms are all screwed up. Be careful about that. And, um, and really have a practice to be taking care of your mental health. So that is, um, I actually, I think my last tip will be, because I just thought, is a transition plan from work to home. I'll go like this so you can see. I'm done work. The shift is done. And whether you live on your own or not, depending on where you are in your career, or what how your life turns out, even if you're going to go home, what is phone's off, the shift is done, I've clocked out, I've tapped out, and I'm going to be going yeah. home. What are you doing in between so that you don't see some fucked up shit at work and walk in the door and just flip your lid because there's shoes on the floor, or your kid a thing, or or go straight to the booze, you are you live on your own, yeah. whatever your circumstances. So how are you turning work off and and turning yourself in, into your next shift of just being a civilian. Where does for all of the work for all of frontline work? What are you doing between those out of that time? So for me, I'll tell you, I I used to work um, in a rural area. It was in the country, and my drive was uh, from one client to the next was like thirty minutes sometimes. And I always kind of complained about it. But then I moved to a urban uh, team and I was in the city. And then my clients were right beside the office and two seconds away and two seconds from each other. And I was finding myself getting really agitated a lot more often and, and kind of like, and I realized I didn't have that decompression time in between each to process. And no. I was going kind of from one shit show to another shit show. And I never really got time to um, process. Decompress and then decompress. same for the going home. Yeah. Yeah, decompress. Exactly. Because uh, I want, you know, windows open, listening to some music, um, you know, I, I, it, you know, just like looking at the and going from one client to the other. And then and, and it was easier the country. So that that drive home and that little commute home, let me leave work over here take the time to transition into just Michelle yeah. and then get home and walk in the door and that time. So that space 
is important to think about and what that looks like for everybody is going to be different. Um, and then the last thing on that one, and then I'm done, is communicating that plan. If you do have a partner or a spouse or kids or anybody is communicating that plan of what you're that you have this transition thing, because when you finish your shift, if your wife's been home with the kids and she's like, where the hell are you, bud? And you're like, I'm going to the gym after she's like, like, hell, you're going to the gym. You come here and take care of the, da, 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 da. like, whatever that is. I'm just thinking of an example. Yeah. yeah. If they, your partners need to know men and women, whatever your, your dynamic is, why it's important if they don't work in a frontline profession, that this is still part of, of the work. And it's, you know, sweetheart, of course, I'm dying to come home too. All I want to do right now is come home, with it, but I need to shift. I need this adrenaline to, to dissipate here in my body. I need to shift from this to this. And this is what I'm going to do and, and be open to that um, communication again early. And if your um, organization, your agency does have a, um, a family night, I know a lot are having those where the 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 family members of the for, for first responder can come and kind of learn about the job that they go to that so they can hear right from your organization what to be expecting as being the family member of the the first line responders. First responder. A lot of them are doing that now to give a speech to the family members so that the first responders can have the support that they need from their family. Which so is which is that's important. what I would say to everything. And that was beautiful because it's nobody talk about, and I talk a lot of people, the in between, the I'm out of shift, go home. That time frame could be 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Some people drive an hour, two hours. They don't talk about it. They just, yeah. and I think it's really important that you have that moment to decompress and just chill, blast music on the radio, whatever you do. Just to when you get home, yeah. you don't you don't put all that stress into your family members or yourself too. Like you said, go straight to drinking or do whatever. So that's really important. I think I never heard somebody talk about it so far. And you, you want you're the first one. I mentioned that little section of between work and home. <laughs> that little yeah. See it. <laughs> and that, that's really important. That actually, yeah, that's 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 so important. Because you can some people actually work. Uh, they get mandatory. So they work instead of 24 and in the fire department's uh, case, 48 hours straight. So you're going from 48 hours yeah. of nonstop to go home to deal with home. You need a break. I don't know. Yeah. You, you need something. You need a break. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I know. And communicate I, yeah. that. What does that communicate. look like? Communicate is important. Yeah. I know you don't have license yet in Florida. We see people want to reach you from the one who listen or will listen in Canada. How do they reach you? Or at least see your social media. Because I think more than, yeah, you, uh, your business and all that, I think what you guys post on social media is really important. And and people, like you said, scrolling down, and, oh, that's a nice message. Oh, that's cool. I think that's important too. And social media have a really benefits, really good parts, and really horrendous parts. So I'm trying to push the good parts of social media, as you've probably seen it on my, on my social media too. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so Emma and I, we are, our, um, handle on Instagram is at frontline underscore therapists with an S on the end. Yes. <laughs> so therapists, plural. So frontline underscore therapists and our, uh, website is frontline wellness therapy.com. Uh, we are, uh, so it, it, we have other practitioners as well. It's not just her and I own the, own the practice, but, uh, so we have our, um, our website there. Uh, you can see us there. If you are in Southwestern Ontario in the GTHA area, so it's the Niagara area, Hamilton, uh, Brantford, Halton region, even PL Toronto, uh, we are in the fall going to be having our, uh, um, groups, uh, for first line uh, responders uh we're going to be running uh, groups on um an evening i believe we're it's going to be a wednesday evening because that's kind of a, a, a swing shift change um yeah. and they're uh, 10 weeks long uh we do uh in person um um 
the office that I see people of is in Hamilton. You're welcome to come there. Uh, we both do virtual and we do have um, one, maybe two practitioners actually do home visits if you are in the GTHA visit uh, area rather. So they will come uh, to your home and do therapy in your family room on your That's couch. actually great. That's actually <laughs> so, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're trying to be huh. really accessible uh, and more more to come in the fall. The summer's a little bit slower, but more to come in the fall. Um, and so you can check our social media. We're pretty active on there between the two of us. Yes. We're always kind of managing that. So, um, And then, of course, we're seeing clients virtually and in person. So that's where we are. Awesome. Uh, you're the first responder, the first responders, mental health-wise. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you're yeah. in. That's what we yeah, I will put anyway all your uh, social media links and all that on the description of the episode. So whoever is in Canada, Ontario uh, area, please reach out. Yeah. When you have the Florida license or authorized to work in Florida, I will be more than glad to share your links and all that over here. Uh, meanwhile, it's just uh, social media is your best tool, at least in the States in Florida. But uh, I hope that actually comes yeah. soon. I hopefully... Uh, you able to help here too or have another option for us in Florida. That will be excellent. That'll be a great tool for us. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we'll share that with everybody. I look forward to it. And I just thank you so much for, you know, using your platform and your experience to share um, to share and again, it, like really raising awareness and reducing stigma. And we're almost there. Like we're, we've made extremely great gains in yes. the last, you know, five years. And you just think of how many gains we've made in five years. I see this as being, uh, as people being in, in 10 years being like, this was ever a stigma. It's going to be so normal that we talk about this. And as easily as someone saying, I'm going to the gym, I'm going to do yoga, I'm going to my therapist it's going to be that normalized. I'm really confident in that. I hope so. I hope so. That's the goal. That's why I'm pushing that. That's why, uh, yeah, that's my little passion project. I wish my, my podcast is your vessel to share information and pass around. I'm not an expert, but I'm the one who pushing that. And hopefully people, at least somebody listen to a podcast and realize they need some help, regardless with you guys in Canada or here in the States or in a part around the world. Now you got tools so you can literally see a therapist no matter where you are, regardless of the company or the yeah. brand or whatever. So there's no excuse to don't go to a therapist. Yeah. It's a thing is the motivation and take the stigma out of, oh, I'm going to see somebody shrink. Or, no, it's not a shrink. It's, it's somebody actually a therapist that can help you. And don't feel bad if you have to switch therapists because you don't click with the other one. You can always find somebody who is the same, right? Oh, no, you should never. I know therapists should ever be offended if you're like, sorry, Michelle, this isn't the vibe. I want you to get help. We're not going to be any therapist that's offended by it is, you know, they, it, it, it's just you have to find who what works for you. And if I'm not the person to help you, I will try to find the person that helped. Like maybe I maybe I work with you and go, you know what? I think so-and-so might be a better fit. Do you mind if I did it? Like there's times where we might do that as a therapist. So do not be afraid of that. Um, if, if they, if a therapist, which 90%, maybe more offer those 15 or 20 minute discovery calls or consultation calls for free, use them, um, and, and interview, you don't have to go with the first one. Just thank you very much. Um, nice meeting you and I'll carry on. So do, there's lots out there. Um, see what's a good fit for you. Yep. That's great. And with that, we actually close the podcast is amazing episode thank you so much michelle i appreciate your time you. appreciate your patience i know it's been a, a work in progress but uh i hope we can have another episode talk about sleeping problems for firefighters or first responders because i don't know how it's canada but we do 24 hour shift or 48 hour shift they do they do here yeah, okay perfect yeah. so so yeah it is not it is it is taking down a lot of people because it's sleeping problem for hormones to uh, mood yeah. swing and on all that and i think that's another episode another podcast if, before i get into that yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah. thank we'll you people for listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah perfect so uh i can wait uh thank you again so much uh people who listen to the podcast i uh, appreciate it for coming back the new ones thank you uh there's more episode please share subscribe uh all that shit that's all over the internet please this is this is your podcast this is your vessel to look for information and uh, if you if you don't like this podcast you can go another one there's a thousand podcasts about mental health and about firefighters so i'm sure it's another tool in the toolbox that's what i look myself 
Any awesome. last words, Michelle, before we go? Just bye. <laughs> nope, just thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah, just bye. <laughs> thanks, bye -bye. everybody. I hope you found it helpful. And we'll see you over on our Instagram or um, yeah. on our website. You can email us and see us there. We look forward to um, seeing you. Yeah, I mean, you can create your own podcast. And I'll be there. Why not? Yes, we could do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll find out. All right, thank you All so right, much. Take and, care, uh, everyone. Goodbye, people. Yeah.